thank you very much, and thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, so in this talk, uh, roughly speaking, it's going to be uh, split into two halves. Uh, one is really about bootstrapping uh, S matrix, the S matrix bootstrap program, uh, program and how we're using the S matrix bootstrap uh, program to, con to tell us a little bit about what uh, the, the nature of quantum gravity. And then the second part, because this will serve as a motivation for toward the second part, which is to try to think about what does string theory means within this, this uh, space of uh, consistent uh, quantum gravity. And so um, the, the results in the second part uh, actually has some overlap with another work that is coming out with uh, Henrietta Elvan and her collaborators. So we are actually realized that we were doing similar things. So we coordinate uh, a, 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 a submission uh, probably at the end of this month. So uh, let's begin uh, with the problem. So we know that uh, for any UV completion of quantum gravity, we know that a low energy always has this kind of a description, which is an effective field th theory d description with uh, some uh, the Einstein-Hilbert term plus higher order correction. So in this talk, I would like to answer the following question. First of all, uh, if we have this kind of parameterization, can we actually carve out the space for these variables, uh, sorry, these coefficients? Uh, in the sense that, and that in the sense of how large are these uh, coefficients allowed, and within this space, can we carve out the landscape of perturbative string theory in general? So, is it like a subset? How small a subset, or under which, uh, under uh, various assumptions, how large you can span this space? Uh, the second question is: Let's say you already have computed uh, some of these coefficients. Let's say the first three. Can you actually recover the information of the UV theory knowing that it is a string theory just by these three coefficients, for example? And, and is there a way to do that? And I'll try to uh, address that. And third, uh, the finally, is let's say you have a, we know that uh, for flat space string theory, these values are very specific values. For example, for uh, the closed type two theories, uh, the co in, at, for the tree level completion, these are basically just zeta numbers. Here, these are just zeta values. And we can ask that, is that actually a solution to a very precise question? Namely, is this a solution to a particular kind of bootstrap? And so these are the three questions that uh, I would like to address. And by the tone, you will see, you can imagine that the answer will be basically positive for all three. So um, as most of you uh, probably uh, know that in the past uh, probably three to four years, there's been a lot of work on applying the S-matrix bootstrap program uh, to understand quantum gravity from various directions, from the authors that you see in these work. You can see some are coming from uh, uh, the pure S-matrix bootstrap people, some are coming from perturbative computation, high order computation, and we've all converged onto this interesting question of now do we have enough technology to constrain uh, what quantum gravity really is from the viewpoint of the scattering amplitude. So what, so what is the goal? So the goal is we, have a, we know that starting from the bottom up, again, as I mentioned, we have a low energy effective theory. And we're going to ask what is, if you assume that it has a, per, uh, a consistent UV completion, what can we say about these coefficients? Now, I, since I've mentioned UV completion, I should be very precise. So there's two kinds of assumptions you can make. One, you can, one is that the, the UV completion is perturbative in the sense that it is completed with a scale that is actually smaller than n Planck, meaning that uh, 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 when the theory is UV completed, gravity is still weakly coupled. So this will be what we, people usually refer as weak coupling co completion. What that means in your effective field theory is that all of these cutoffs that you have here are all of uh, a, a, a cutoff scale that is smaller than n Planck. If, on the other hand, the, the UV completion is non-perturbative, then these cutoffs are just directly in Planck itself. So this is two different scenarios of, of what we mean by UV completion when you're just sitting at low energy. It's really about what, where the cutoff is. And of course, as we all know, the string theory actually gives a solution to these two kinds of uh, problems just by controlling uh, what G string is. Now we're going to try to learn uh, how, to, how to constrain this uh, by considering the bootstrapping the four-point scattering amplitude 
of the graviton uh, scattering amplitude. Now, since of course the advantage is that it's a physical observable, it's a physical observable, and therefore it's subject to its own consistency condition. So I'm, I've listed the consistency conditions that we're going to impose, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll explain in more detail as we go along. Now, first of all, we're going to assume that the, the UV completion is unitary, which means that this uh, amplitude can be written as a partial wave expansion. Uh, where the partial waves uh, has the property that the imaginary part is positive. Now, of course, uh, you actually imp impose much more. This is essentially linear of, uh, uh, positivity. There's actually nonlinear constraints that you can impose. But right now, in this talk, I'm just going to impose this condition. The second is analyticity, which is that uh, the amp for amplitude, where the, if you control t to be smaller than m squared, so m squared here will be set by your cutoff. The amplitude is essentially analytic on the complex uh, S-plane away from the real axis. And this you can uh, prove to various degrees to, uh, using uh, causality. Now, the, very, the most important and most contra or like previously controversial uh, statement is the boundedness of this function, which uh, the, now the claim is that this for, sorry, I should mention that for T uh, sitting in this value, um, as you take s to infinity, you only care about the absolute value of s. As you take s to infinity, this amplitude is suppressed by s squared. Okay, so this is, uh, um, so, it's, so it's said in a, uh, uh, another way is that the amplitude will satisfy twice subtraction. And finally, it's crossing that the amplitude in the physical region where s is in, this, in the s channel scattering region can be analytically continued to the u channel scattering region, which means that that, for example, the discontinuity of S channel is the same as the discontinuity of the U channel. So that's essentially what uh, crossing means. Okay, so how, so let, how can we use these uh, constraints to constrain your EFT? Well, the point is that your EFT, all of these coefficients is actually map. So you have, we're interested in all these, these uh, derivative coupling coefficients. And so these are directly mapped to how the amplitude actually behaves at low energy. So when, when, the, when you look at the four-point amplitude and you take S and T to be small, for example, let's say we, we uh, consider perturbative completion, that means that uh, we can suppress gravitational loops. And therefore, the, that means that at low energy, you, you know that your amplitude takes this form. It has the usual Einstein-Hilbert term that gives you the STU pole. You have some masses poles ar arising from either R square or R cube corrections, and then you have a polynomial expansion. So that means that on the complex S plane, the amplitude basically looks like this. You have some poles here reflecting the masses pose, and then you have a branch cut. Now, importantly, this branch cut doesn't continue all the way to zero because the gravitational poles or the gravitational loops are suppressed. So there's no masses branch cut cutting all the way to, to, to zero at this point. So if you assume this for perturbative completion, if you assume this, then what you can do is you can define a contour integral. So let's consider this contour here. And this contour, where I'm, I'm taking my amplitude, I'm taking the contour, where this contour is circling here. Since it's circling to low energy, that means that it's, the amplitude will behave like this around this region. And then by just playing away, playing well with what kind of uh, integration measure you have, you can judiciously, uh, judiciously pick up with whichever uh, coefficient you want here. So you just pick up each coefficient at a time, and of course these coefficients are just the linear combination of these coefficients here. So in other words, your EFT, the information that you're interested in EFT emerges as the as a counter integral of your amplitude around the origin. And you're, so basically it's, you can pick out these coefficients analytically from uh, considering this counter integral. Now, of course, in the complex session, you also have this branch cut so you can imagine that the counter, the, the, the counter integral that you have here is going to be related to the branch cut that you have here and how the amplitude behaves at infinity. Now, of course, the branch cut we know that is just given by the imaginary part of the amplitude. And so this is a handle where you can implement unitarity. So if you can relate this to this and somehow drop out uh, this contribution in infinity, then we have a good, very good handle of how to constrain the, these couplings here. So that's basically uh, the idea. Now you can also consider non-perturbative completion. So the difference between the perturbative completion and non-perturbative completion 
is that since uh, now these corrections are given suppressed by n Planck, that means you cannot drop, you cannot throw away uh, corrections in terms of n Planck. And that means that you, you can no longer drop the, gravi uh, the gravitational loops. That means that analytically your amplitude now looks like this. You just have an entire uh, cut going through the origin. If you have, if, if you have uh, th this situation, then what you can do is to consider a counter integral of this form where you have a low energy arc compared to this infinity, which is a high energy arc. And since again, at around, uh, around S near zero, and of course we're keeping T equals, uh, T being small, you start with an EFT, you can, the, the behavior of your amplitude here is calculable. So this is calculable from your EFT. And then, so you can, again, you have these coefficients you identify, which you integrate, uh, instead of doing a counter integral to pick up coefficients here, you do your integration over your counter, uh, sorry, over this arc. And then you have a smeared observable, which is computed by taking the low energy amplitude substitute here, and then you just do the integration. And again, these smear observables will be related to the imaginary, again, the imaginary part of the high energy behavior here, as well as how things behave at infinity. So, but basically the point punchline is that depending on whether you're interested in perturbative or non-perturbative, there's, there's basically ways to, to, to deal with both technically. So now we can combine everything. So again, we have these coefficients. So now I'm going to just assume perturbative completion for now on. Uh, so we're going, so now these coefficients, again, are related by counter integrals of your amplitude. And since you already know from analyticity that, that, that the amplitude is analytic away from the real axis for fixed T, that means that the previous integral that you're doing here can be analytically continue away, picking up only non-analyticity here, which are the massive poles or the branch cup of your UV theory and contribution from infinity. So that means your amplitude can be written in this form. So the, your amplitude analytic can be written as this, there's some subtraction term, which is really related to the contribution that you have here, I have listed here. And then you have contribution from your S channel and U channel, which are the analyticity here. And of course, they're given by the imaginary part of your amplitude. Now, of course, uh, you know that the imaginary part is just an imaginary part of your partial wave. If you expand your amplitude in partial waves, and importantly, we know that this is positive. Okay, so the, 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 essentially the game is that use this equation, this dispersion relation with these being positive on the right hand side, on the left hand side, you do this counter integral to extract your coefficient and we try to derive bound on these coefficients. So now to, to some subtle issues. So first of all, what's going to happen here? It better be that I may, I'll be able to throw this away because if we, if we cannot throw this away, then essentially what this is requiring is you actually need to know what the UV of the theory is, which, you, which means that you know what the UV completion, which we don't know. So we need to have general arguments of how we can throw the contribution of this away. And this comes back to the statement that I had before, that now we have uh, arguments for why that, that, that in general your, your gravitational scattering amplitude is actually bounded by S squared. Now, uh, many of you heard uh, this kind of dis uh, discussion before about um, scattering amplitude being bounded in the four limit that is bounded. There's the famous Frosshoff bound, which always, when you, you mention this, then we immediately see to say that, but we're talking about a gravitational scattering, which is massless and doesn't have a gap. Usually the old, uh, way, the old uh, theorems that we have where the amplitude is bounded always assume that you have a gap. So how do you now, for a gapless theory, how can people actually say that amplitude is now, is, is, can prove this? So basically the, the point is that for a gapless theory, especially for gravity, we actually have another control. And that is, by, this, which is, by the way, this argument is laid out uh, very nicely in uh, uh, Sasha Zyboidev and uh, uh, Karen Herring's uh, paper, uh, where basically the point is that you know that a large impact parameter space so if you for transform your amplitude to large impact parameter for your transforming T, a large impact parameter is just, it should just be GR. This is the usual sense that we say that high energy gravity, it doesn't necessarily mean you have quantum gravity effects. I mean, you have planets scattering 
or planets collision, these, this doesn't mean that you have quantum gravity effect. That's because you have a high, large center of mass collision, but these are large impact parameters. And so that means that large param impact parameters is well described by GR. So you can use this information. And that means that uh, you use this information and you combine that with the fact that a large impact parameter and a high energy that actually corresponds to a large spin because the relation between your spin, uh, your center of mass energy and impact parameter generally takes this form. So if you have some fixed B, uh, a large high energy, this means that you're looking at high spin. So that means that the high spin part of your partial wave, so that means that if you go to fixed impact parameter, the high spin part of your partial wave must be able to reproduce the gravitational, the GR part. And from this, you can derive a bound directly. You can derive that the, the, the partial waves uh, for your higher spin mode must take this particular form as J goes to infinity at the high spin limit. So the higher spin part of your partial wave is bounded by the fact that it should reproduce GR uh, at large impact parameter space. And then uh, the, the lower spin, you can just use, the, you, you can just use the, the standard partial wave upper bound, and they've successfully derived this uh, proof for this argument here. So, we, so even though the gravity is gapless, we can now trust that uh, statement. Now, if we trust this statement, then we can say the following, that uh, since the amplitude is now bounded by S squared as S goes to infinity, that means that as long as you have sufficient power of S here be beyond S squared, there's no longer uh, contribution and infinity, it's suppressed. And therefore you have a direct relationship between the, the Wilson coefficients and, this, uh, and uh, the, the counter integral. So basically for N bigger than two, uh, sorry, this should be N plus one here. Sorry, this is not K minus Q, this is actually N plus one. So for n bigger than two, bigger or equal than two, the Wilson coefficient now can be directly related to the imaginary part without the subtraction term. So, 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 so now we can uh, start to use the fact that the imaginary part is positive to bound the Wilson coefficient. There's also another issue for gravity, which is the famous graviton pole problem for the n equals two part or the s square part. The issue is the following. So, okay, so this equation actually holds now for anything with n greater or equal to two. If you look at n equals two, you'll notice that at low energy, uh, since the low energy amplitude takes this form, in the near four limit, it actually behaves at s squared over t plus dot, 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 dot. This is the Einstein-Hilbert part. So for n equals two, that means we're picking out anything that is s squared. That means that we're picking out a graviton pole. But at the same time, we're taking t goes to zero limit. So what that actually means is that for the low energy to be equal to the high energy dispersion relation, you're going to have this equation here. So this is the low energy part, which is related to the high energy. And since we're taking T goes to zero, this part is divergent, and therefore this part is also divergent. So that just means that your dispersion relation is not a convergent uh, dispersion relation. So you have a dispersive sum of your amplitude, but this dispersive sum is useless because it's not a, converg a convergent series. And so this is the, 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 the famous T, but, but of course you can choose to not look at this and just consider N bigger than two uh, to, and, and avoid this. But at the end of the day, we're really interested in gravity. So the, the fact that you have a gravitational pole is, is what the hallmark of gravity. So you would really like to address this uh, issue. And luckily, uh, uh, by uh, work by Dunbar, Simon Karen Hoyt, and his collaborators, they've developed a way to actually now tackle this, uh, this uh, t equals zero uh, pole problem, which is instead to consider smeared amplitude. So you know that you have a pole here, no problem. You just consider, multiply this by a function, which allows you to regulate this pole uh, here and has nice property and, and you can do uh, the smeared, uh, you try to bound the, the smeared amplitude. Now, if you do this, uh, there's only one complication is that previously, as I mentioned um, before, essentially when we're writing something like this, we're, at low energy, we're considering a polynomial expansion in S and T. And this polynomial expansion in S and T allows us to identify what the Wilson coefficients are. 
Uh, but if you're actually smearing the amplitude, you're also considering the amplitude away from st small because you're doing this integration here. So that means you can, you're really not, no longer doing a, a polynomial expansion in small s and t. Then what do you actually mean by these Wilson coefficients? Uh, so uh, here, what they actually consider is to consider multiple uh, dispersive representations, uh, which of course now, because you're not doing a small expansion and, and, and here, instead of t, they're using uh, u. Um, instead of uh, a polynomial expansion, uh, these are no longer considered to be small, but you can still consider linear combinations such that uh, since the same uh, coefficients appear in here, so for g4 appear in here and g4 appear in here, so you can consider uh, the, the, the linear combination of these different dispersion relations to get what is called an improved dispersion relation, which allows you to isolate the Wilson co coefficients. So they're, uh, they, they're able to do that now. Uh, I should mention that there's another uh, uh, way of dealing with this T-Po problem, which is called the Rigi subtractions, uh, which is uh, uh, done by these collaborations. And basically what they say is that instead of, uh, in instead of uh, trying to smear the amplitude, since you already know that you have an equality, sorry, you have a, a divergence uh, series here, you have a di divergent result here and you have a divergent series here. But since, they're di since this is a strict equality, that means that a divergence in this uh, series is exactly the divergence that you have for the graviton pole. So you basically you just move the graviton pole onto this side and you know that you have a finite series and you try to estimate uh, what is the, the, the remaining, uh, uh, re or you try to pro uh, give a parametric argument for what is the, the, the remaining term and use this information as, as a bound the, to your EFT. Now, finally, uh, you might say that uh, here I'm talking about a function of S and T, which are just Mandelspin, but we're, we're really talking about scattering of gravitons. So, well, so how do I incorporate the fact that these are uh, gravitational states that are being scattered? In other words, how do I incorporate spins? So this can be done now both in D equals four and away from four. D equals four is actually pretty simple. It's just a reflection of the fact that you have uh, definite helicity states on the external. And so instead of the usual, the, the, the expansion basis of your partial wave, instead of your usual uh, expansion basis, which is Legendre polynomial, now you just have Wigner D matrices, which you can work out explicitly. For higher dimension, this is a slightly more complicated. It's just because then in four dimension, uh, when you're exchanging Lorentz invariance representation, these are little group representation, which are SO3 or SU2. The irreducible representation of SU2 is very simple. However, in higher dimension, the, the little group is bigger for massive representation. And that means that you're going to start to have mixed representations that you, you can have in your exchange. And, but uh, since in the external, you're still scattering graviton states. So that means that the, the external states will be, uh, will have polarization vectors, which must satisfy uh, ward identity. So it, it, that, that will constrain what are the allowed uh, polynomial structures that you can have. So basically uh, the, the complete basis has been worked out last year in this paper. And now we can, uh, now one can just also analyze this in higher dimensions. So these are all the technical uh, uh, things that one needs to overcome. And now we can just look at the result. So in, in this talk, I'm just gonna show you four dimension bounds. So in four dimensions, so just to show you, so we have, we're scattering gravitons. So we have different, depending on your helicity, we essentially have three different helicity structure, the plus, plus, minus, minus, the single minus and the all plus. Uh, their helicity structures can be, uh, can be, uh, absorbed by an overall, uh, overall spinner uh, weight factors here. And so we're really interested in these scalar functions of Mandelstam. Uh, these Mandelstam, of course, you can expand them in polynomials to get uh, the different coefficients here, which are related to your higher dimension operators. For example, here, alpha one corresponds to R square phi uh, operator, alpha two corresponds to R cube operators, and these are R four operators with higher derivative uh, uh, acting on them. Uh, again, all of these now all of these couplings can be defined as an exp as as a analytic contour integral on your amplitude. 
And these amplitude have a dispersive representation where instead of doing an integral, I just write a sum, it's the same uh, for us. And you can see that because there's various different helicity structures here, there's all different kinds of helicity structure, uh, that is reflected in the fact that uh, these uh, functions that you have here are uh, depend on the external helicity uh, factors. So um, these Wigner D matrices have, uh, have the, um, basically H and H to H, so that depends on the helicity on the externals, so. Okay, is there any questions at this point? Okay, now we're going to do, now of course this is a very complicated system to do, to, 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 to analyze. So we're going to use, uh, which is one of the reasons why, why there's been a lot of work recently is, is that the numerical methods that people have been using very successfully in CFD bootstrap, now we're using this in the S matrix bootstrap. And the, the, the method is uh, semi-definite programming. And so you see that, that, that so, so what, is, what are we trying to do? So again, so you have the amplitude on the left-hand side and through these contour integrals, we can pick out the Wilson coefficients. We, might, we would like to maximize or minimize the Wilson coefficient while respecting this inequality. So this inequality, the, the, the only uh, information you have about this equality, you don't know what the mass is. You just have that this expanded on this function here. And for example, here, you only have the information that these are positive. But for example, for here, this is actually not even positive. These are just products of three points where they actually are not the same. So, so this is not a definite, pro uh, so these are not just positive coefficients. And to deal with this, we use semi-definite programming. And so basically the, the way that we do, I'm just gonna use one slide to explain, to, to explain basically what is being done. So this equation here, so, um, sorry. So this equation here on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, we're going to expand in S and T and do the matching. And this means that I have an equation that looks like this. So let me just explain here. So here, this is represent the different helicity uh, external states coupling to the internal state. And these are just some coefficients that I don't know. Here, these are three by three, each of one of these are three by three matrices, which are reflecting the dispersion relation that gives you the Wilson coefficients here. So the, the first two are the two, let's say we have two Wilson coefficients. The fine, then you have a set of other three by three matrices which are reflecting the crossing symmetry uh, relations, which is, for example, the fact that uh, this amplitude is actually just the same as this amplitude just by reordering. So that means that if you expand in both of these equations, they should give you the same result. And that gives you uh, a set of null constraints here, which are all, so all of these has to be zero. So we organize everything into this form. So these are our three by three matrices multiplied by whatever coupling constant you, you could have. And you're, of course, you're summing over uh, uh, all of the possible UV states. So what semi-definite programming does is that you look at this equation, you try to get a bound between B1, B2, and you do, all you know is just that you know these matrices and you don't know what these values are, how can you get the bound? So the, the way you do this is basically you scan, the, the program scans over all possible linear combinations of these three by three matrices. So it scans over, uh, uh, a, a set of uh, vector which tells you how are you combining these three by three matrices. What it tries to find is it tries to find a particular combination. So V dot F, where F is just, I'm just writing these, this as a vector F. So it tries to find a linear combination such that it's always definite positive. Once you actually, once you find a linear combination such that this is positive, what are these values actually not, no longer important because this is a positive definite matrix in, in the middle. And once you have this, then on the left, on the right hand side, V dotted into this also has to be positive definite. And if you, you take V dotted into this, you have the linear combination of these two coefficients, the Wilson coefficient that you're interested in, that is definite positive. And therefore you get the bound on the ratio of these coefficients. So that's essentially what linear programming is doing. It's scanning through all possible combination of, of, of these uh, polynomial functions. Uh, I like, okay, there's some subtlety here, but uh, okay. 
So here is an example of the result. So I just directly show you the result. So this is the bound that you will get for D, for example, I just picked DA R to the four operator. There's, uh, there's actually two independent uh, uh, structures for DA R to the four. Uh, this was an earlier bound uh, that used only part of the uh, uh, part of the um, uh, crossing symmetry region. There's actually more. So if you include more, then actually the, the region actually shrinks. So, so, okay, this is very nice. This is working. So we see that the loud ratio of these Wilson coefficients are actually bounded. Uh, of course, once you have this bound, if you were interested in looking at all your favorite theories where they actually uh, live inside this region. Uh, by the way, now this bound, this region is now stable. So basically, this is reflecting what uh, what uh, this is reflecting uh, the 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 positivity bound of the, the positivity of the partial waves and uh, the crossing symmetry. But the reason that I say this is is stable. What I mean by stable is that when you're implementing crossing symmetry, there's always a derivative expansion, and you can always increase your derivative expansion. So stable means that uh, the bounds are no longer is is converging. So that's what, what I mean by that. Okay, so you see that it's, 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 it's interesting that the known string theories, for example, in the known string theory in flat space, they lie in closely, but not exactly at the boundary of this region. But actually, if you try to generate an effective theory by, for example, integrating away a massive scalar, a massive fermion, a massive vector, you also get uh, coefficients that are basically just lying in here. Okay, so there's actually not a lot of things that are exploring this region here. So, so why is it that all the known theories are actually uh, located in this tiny island uh, here? So this is one of the interesting questions that we're trying to uh, understand. Sorry. Yes. When you're talking about the string theory results, when you're talking about the string theory results, is it like some three-level calculation? Yes, three-level okay. calculation. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I should mention. We expect to match this to tree-level tree cal calculation because we're doing the, the perturbative bootstrap, which means that we're not doing the graviton loop. We're suppressing the graviton loop. So this would be the tree. We're just taking the tree level. Um, right, OK. So again, yeah, so, so what is going on in this region here, in this big uh, empty region? Well, actually, that empty region is not so big if you look in the other direction. So if we actually consider another, so of course, this is plotting two ratios. You can actually plot a third ratio. You can look at a three-dimension plot. And uh, I just basically plot the equal height of the third direction. So the third direction is, is let's take another coupling normalized by this is the R4 operator. And basically, what this is, what this, this, this direction coming out of the slide is, is, is measuring, is measuring your, how fine-tuned your theory is. Because we've set our cut, we've normalized our cutoff to one here. And you can see that actually all these regions are very fine-tuned. So for example, this blue region, uh, so everything is normalized by one. So if it's not fine-tuned, then these coefficients should be of order one. But you see that these, these regions here, uh, are given by like, for example, a ratio of 10 to the minus nine. As you go further, further out here, you have 10 to the minus 13. So these are really fine tuned regions here uh, that are actually living here. And so therefore, in some sense, it's not so surprising that the physical theories are living in this tiny island here, which is not fine tuned. So in this sense, uh, it, it's reasonable, but it's still a little bit, uh, uh, not ideal that our bootstrap cannot rule out these fine-tuned theories. So that's the issue. So we cannot really rule out these extremely fine-tuned uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, yeah, this is just another, uh, 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 an, another uh, uh, a plot which shows that instead the, the four derivative coupling, the four derivative uh, of R, uh, normalized with R to the four operator. And, and it, this, in this case, with, uh, with the, the, the maximal, well, actually up to K equals five, the, the K equals five null constraint is actually stabilizing. And in this plot, the, the known theories are, are actually populating uh, a, a more, a more com is covering more a complete region of the plot. Sorry, can you also? Yeah. 
Uh, this one we do know exactly in, well, at least in type 2b. Exactly. So that's the type 2b value here. And, and of course, you, you in strictly, the I cannot... over all the values, all yeah. the possible values. Yeah. yeah. So this is where it actually, like, in principle, I shouldn't do this because this is non-perturbative, yeah. but, but we still did, yeah. So, so this is exactly the, 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 the SDO, the, 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 the entire moduli is going from here to here. Thank you. And maybe, uh, spoiler, are you going to show us also uh, the coefficient, any, any bound on the coefficient of R squared and R cubed? Uh, Can you say anything from the bootstrap? Because those vanish in type 2B. Of course, supersymmetry. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. But you're not imposing any supersymmetry. Yeah, we're not right? imposing yeah. supersymmetry here. But yeah. Can but... you say anything about those coefficients with the bootstrap? So this is what I am trying. What I will try to do in the second part. Yeah, precisely because the issue is that at least currently, at, at, so currently, if we were just doing bootstrap on the gravitational S matrix, then uh, we're not. Yeah, so we, we're still far away from the known theories, and we, and and of course. I'll mention about about uh, what we can try, what, what uh, possibilities that we can try to do in the future. But right now, I, I really really like to shrink this space as fast as possible, which is uh, what what I will try to do uh, next. Yeah, and I integrate the massive scalar. It's going to generate uh, a, 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 it's going to generate uh, uh, these higher dimension operators. Yeah. So uh, in light of time, so let me just directly go to, so these are just uh, different uh, other bounds that one can derive and, and, and compare for finite impact parameter, for example. But let me just skip to now I would like to shrink the space. So previously we we're doing bottom up, just S matrix bootstrap with assumptions, nothing else and doing bottom up. Now I would like to ask the question about what about top down? So let's just say I have string theory and how much string theory can span this space? So if I, if I just have string theory, then of course I need to be specific. What do I mean by string theory? How do, how, what, yeah, what is the precise a statement that I mean by string theory? Well, if, since string theory is, is really a theory of quantum gravity, one of the inter, important uh, features that it has is that the scattering amplitude at high energy is actually not bounded by S squared, but it's actually polynomial suppressed. It has this polynomial suppression. So, Naively, one thing that you would like to have is to imp how to implement this, po this, sorry, this exponential suppression. So how do you uh, actually incorporate this exponential suppression? Well, it's kind of difficult to actually imp incorporate this, but we can trace back to the source of this exponential suppression is, of course, the fact that the string theory has a world sheet. And the world sheet has this Kovanielson factor here which at high energy, uh, you can evaluate this co the contribution of a Kobanilson by the saddle point approximation, which precisely gives you this exponential suppression factor. In other words, uh, string theory has a world sheet, which has this particular, particular, uh, particular uh, structure. So the goal of the second part is I want to encode, the, the, I want to implement the, the statement that I actually have a world sheet. So what if I start with, uh, I have an S matrix, and I ask that this S matrix has a world sheet description. And, and, how, and, and what does this do to my bounds? So I'm going to, so the assumption is the following. So I'm going to assume that I have a world sheet description. So I'm just going to assume that, so my world sheet description tells me that I'm going to have Z and Z bar with this particular uh, construction with multiplied by a function that can be a function of polarization vectors, momentum, and Z and Z bar. But I'm not going to assume that I know anything about this function. Now, if I have this, then immediately what I can do is I can factorize, of course, left and right into an open string. So I can, instead of fo focusing on closer, I can just focus on the open string. So again, I open string, I have this Kobanielson factor sitting here with this unknown function here. Of course, this is natural for any perturbative string theory because you know that any perturbative string theory, you're going to have a vertex operator that take this form. Uh, you're going to have the exponential k dot x, where x is a flat direction, for example, our four dimension. And then you have this uh, function here, uh, which depends on polarization and your momentum k. And as long as your x uh, two point function uh, is the usual uh, disk two point function, then you're going to get this form, irrespective of what is the detail of this vertex operator here is. So I'm going to try to use the information that I have this. Now, let me make a side comment. You, can, you, can, you might imagine that, uh, what if I want to be general? Could I, how much, how general can you about this function here? 
So can we have a, can I, can I just have some random function V of S here? Well, actually, no, for the following reason. So let's say, first of all, we're interested in the, in, in the case where we actually have a massless pole. Where is the pole of this function here? The pole is, is, is happening when z equals one and z equals zero. So that means if you want to have a massless pole, well, first of all, this has to be a non-positive integer at zero. So this is regular at s equals zero. This has to be a regular function. And since this is be, the pole is appearing at z equals one and zero, so if you have a random function that looks like this, the specific form of the pole is going to be look like Vs minus n here. And since uh, we expect our, our function should have the usual particle poles, and that means that we really need this to be s. So that already tells you that this can, is just v minus, Vs has to be minus s plus a, where a is an integer. Now I should mention that you can actually get away with it, which is something that was, uh, in, was given in the talk in this year's string, is that if, you, if this function was not single value, if it was multi-value, then you can get away with this. So for a, a simple example is, for example, if V plus minus, there's, V is multi-value, so you have plus branch and minus branch. And instead of this function, if it's single value, then you, you're, you're, you only have one choice. But if it's multi-value, you can sum over different branches. And for example, then you will have that the propagator takes this form, it's not, the, each individually is not the usual propagator, but the combined, as after you sum over the two branches, it gives you the usual propagator. And this is what uh, uh, Clifford Chun and Grant Riemann in the, in the Biscop dual resonance, essentially what they're actually doing in, on the world sheet is, is this. Of course, then you need to have uh, an understanding of why you actually get this kind of, how do you get this from string theory? Um, but uh, if, we, if we just get, if we just assume that we have this, then, the, then uh, a linear function is, the, is, what you, is what you'll get. Okay, good. So, so this is basically what I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume that amplitude comes from something that looks like this. So how can, what information can I extract uh, that constrains my amplitude? Well, first of all, it's on the world, it's on a disk. So you have three different ordering, for example, for four points. That depends on whether you're fixing two to be, be between three, four, or or, uh, or one, sorry, one, three, or three, four, and so forth. So you have three different orderings. They basically take the same form because you're starting from this, except for because of the fact that this is absolute value. So there's actually a minus one difference compared to all three, besides, of course, the integration region. What this means is that these three amplitudes are actually related by what is called a monotomy relation. Because you can take, for example, because you can take the counter integral from one to infinity, you can do a counter deformation to go to, for example, zero, zero to one and z minus infinity to zero with extra monotomy picking out around z equals one and z equals zero. So uh, just to show you how does that, this, is, this happens? So for example, you start with this integral. Again, you don't care what this function is. Then this is going from one to infinity. You can de counter deform this to here. And from the, one, the zero to one, this is the one ordering. And from minus infinity to zero, this is the other ordering. So that means that the distinct ordering picks up, uh, picks up a non-trivial monodromy sitting, uh, sitting here. These are the non-trivial monodromy. And so that means that these amplitude actually must satisfy this kind of monodromy relation. So again, this is just using, it doesn't use anything about f of z, it just used that, the fact that you have this uh, Koba-Nielsen factor. But this is, this is extremely powerful relation because that actually relates the IR to the UV. Because now uh, you can see, so again, your amplitude has to satisfy these relation so first, let's try to assume that we have maximal SUSY. So I'm going to try and assume maximal SUSY. So this is so that just means that, that my amplitude is proportional to the supercharge here with some Mandelstam variable, and these are the EFT expansion. Now the monogamy relation will immediately tell me that B and C equal zero. So that so that's the of course that's also reflected by supersymmetry. B and C is related to the F cube operator and the F square phi operator, which is zero. But it tells you much more because the monogamy immediately tells you that, that this coefficient here has to be pi square over six. And these coefficients has these precise value here. Again, this is assuming maximal SUSY. 
But of course, still, these coefficients are completely unfixed. These can be random coefficients at, at, the, at, at the moment. Now I'm going to impose unitarity, uh, again, using the dispersive uh, representation I had before for these coefficients. But in light of time, uh, it's basically the same. So I'm just going to skip the detail. You mean the pi square over six? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so it's basically, yeah, it's basically, you, you be, as you see that if you're expanding, uh, it's because of that this has a factor of pi. So if you're expanding, so you're, you're solving this equation. So basically what you do is you take this uh, EFT uh, representation, you plug it in here, you expand S and T, and for each order it has to be zero. Right, so at this point, I only see that it's pi squared over six. I don't actually see that it's zeta. But I don't realize it. But uh, okay, so now with this, so now because these coefficients are fixed, so these can be now my what, what I call the new null, the monodromy null constraints. And I, now I look for these coefficients that are consistent with unitarity. And this is the result. So for example, this is G10, which is this coefficient here. The string theory value is zeta three. And I don't know if it's clear, but you can see this is already down to five digits. That the, and this is converging as we increase in the number of a monodromy constraint. And so of course, unitarity, you have to ask well, which unit, I mean, in which dimension, unitary and what dimension we're talking about. So if you're just requiring unitarity in four dimension, uh, and this is comparing to unitarity in 10 dimension, but you see that this coefficient is constrained to 10 to the minus six, at, at, and you can, uh, to the known value for, to, for zeta three. You might see that this is just the first leading coefficient, so not, imp is there a question? Open three. Yeah, so you might think that this is just uh, the leading coefficient. Actually, no, for each coefficient we look, they're all constrained to a particular value. So this is the G4, this is just to show you G31 and G41, which will be already sitting deep in here. I just plugged it out. And uh, again, unitarity con constrains that these are all up to four digits in, in the vertical plot. And you can see that uh, these, we can now constrain all of these to 10 to the minus seven for the, for the particular, around the particular value of your, of your known string theory. Can you repeat that also for closed string? In particular, do all the So the point is that we don't need to do anything for closed string because if, if you already know that uh, if, yeah, so the point is that Oops, sorry. If the closed string looks like this, then you get the op you know that open string like this. So it conversely, if, I, if I'm using the fact that open string uh, has this Copa Nielsen factor, I can use KLT to, to construct my closed string EFT. Of course, uh, the closed string EFT will not be automatically unitary. Unitary. So then, when you when you do this, uh, I'll mention later on. When you do this double copy, you, now you have to reimpose unitarity again. You'll notice that uh, I only I only test unitarity up to d equals ten. You might think that this is because I know the answer, so I only stop at d equals ten. No, actually, you can try to do d equals eleven, and the point is that you can analytically prove that. That this is un inconsistent at d equals 11. So there's no solution at d equals 11. So again, what am I doing? I'm just imposing the, the, the consistency of these Wilson coefficient at low energy without knowing my full high energy amplitude. Combined with monodromy relation, uh, we are able to, to ha have a certificate of, in, uh, of infeasibility for d equals 11. So you can, so this is the plot for various dimension, but it stops at 10 because at d equals 11, uh, there's an infeasibility. So this is, so you, already at low energy, you can see that this theory is inconsistent uh, beyond uh, 11 dimension. And even more, you can actually get the spectrum from these low energy coupling. So again, since I'm doing semi-definite programming, so I can actually read off the spectrum at given derivative order 
So this is just to show what the spectrum looks like when I'm looking at the, the discoupling G10, when I was maximally and minimizing discoupling. And so uh, here for different, so these different colors means that there, there's a parameter in my uh, definite programming, which is the spin truncation. So this means that th since these are not overlapping, this where uh, as I increase spin truncation, so that means that this is not stable, we shouldn't trust this. We only trust overlapping, and you can see that the majority of the overlapping states are now lie, beginning to start to lie on the trajectory that you expect uh, from string theory. So again, all of this is not knowing what the UV amplitude is. We're just doing just the IR coefficients and using the monotony uh, uh, conditions to constrain. And uh, yes, finally, so, so uh, once you have the monotony conditions, then you can just plug this into the, the formula that we have that relates the open string for the closed string. Uh, so you just plug in the open string uh, coefficients here, and then you have the direct relation between the closed string and the open string co coefficient, and then you just basically implement, and you can draw out the closed string uh, result. This was a genus zero. Yes, this is a genus zero. Yeah, uh, well, okay, so so if I want to do higher, but then, uh, so then it comes down to what analytic properties can you extract from the two point, from the the two point function of your genus, yeah, the genus zero, genus one Green's function. So what kind of specific property can you extract? Once you have that, then we can, we can, yeah. Now, it's not in some sense, you, 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 you might say that it's not surprising that uh, we get uh, this unique answer here, uh, that we're approaching a, a unique, looks like a unique answer because we're imposing maximal SUSY. And so indeed, if you actually don't impose maximal SUSY, you get a region. So this is a, 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 a plot for just taking a scalar amplitude and again imposing monodromy. And we look at the, at the, what the monodromy allows within the EFT space. And so this is a usual scalar EFT uh, uh, spa, uh, coefficient for a particular. This is essentially a six derivative operator. And generic for generic EFT, you will have this is allow, this is consistent with unitarity. But with monodromy, we can see in this direction, this is shrinking uh, to the usual superstring. So there seems to be uh, a universality with superstring. And, but in this direction, there's actually a region where you can actually span. So at the current stage, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take, uh, we're trying to consider, of course, for masses vector, uh, this region, and we're trying to do double copy to see uh, what, uh, how much we can span for the space of the graviton. But uh, I think, uh, let me just, uh, this is the near the end of my talk. So let me just uh, summarize. So, so it's really, there's two parts. So right now, if we just, from bottom up, uh, for, for all the constraints that we know, now uh, we can constrain the, the, the space of our EFT, where the, the, the allowed space is now still considerably large compared to the known theories. Although we, there's physical quote unquote arguments for why these regions are not supposed to be populated, but in terms of analytic bootstrap point of view, uh, these regions are still not, uh, we we're not able to rule it out. Uh, there's some discussions about the finite impact parameters bound, which I did, did not discuss, but uh, we can all also do that. But actually, so on the, on the top down, uh, bottom down, uh, sorry, top down approach, we can start to think about perturbative string EFTs by implementing monodromy relation. And as you see that um, uh, if you just impose maximum SUSY, we have uh, very confident, we have a, a lot of uh, evidence that suggests there's actually just one solution for maximum SUSY. And of course, there's various different uh, questions. Uh, is there anything more you can compose, you can impose on your EFT to try to shrink this space? Uh, there's uh, one of the things that I'm really promoting is to consider consistent higher spin scattering. So let me just mention this, which is I think this, which is really the next step of the bootstrap program, which is as many of you know that there's a lot of amplitudes in, in the past, which has been written down at four point, but didn't have a higher point generalization. So you can think about what actually higher point generalization is really testing. From a physical point of view, the higher point uh, generalization of an amplitude is really testing. So at, at four point, you're really only testing the, how the light states couple to the massive states. But once you go to higher points, now you're imposing consistency of the interactions between the massive states. So these uh, self-interactions now become important to be consistent. 
So in other words, it's probing the consistency of the entire spectrum. But of course, the problem is that we have very, or well, generically, we have a not so well analytic control of these higher point amplitude to actually analyze consistency. However, the same set of things you can actually uh, um, uh, analyze consistency, but still sticking at four point, but now putting these massive states on the outside. So really the, what one should do is really to take these massive, so for example, take the gap state and put the gap state in outside and require global consistency. And this is very reminiscent to the CFD bootstrap where as many of you know that in the CFD bootstrap really when you start to see island is when you consider mixed operators, not the single operator. So I really uh, like to promote that this is really the next thing that we should uh, look at. Okay, so let me just end here. Thank you very much.